When I wake up in the morning, because I'm an old farm boy, I'm ready to go. I don't want to lay around in the bed and do nothing, so I immediately get up. I can get out of my house in 19 minutes, <laughs> uh, freshly shaven and freshly showered. Uh, but I want to come to the office, because usually in the shower in the morning, knowing that I want to spend about three hours writing, I develop perhaps the title to the next chapter. I mean, that's something I do in the shower. Rather than singing, because I sing very badly, I come up with maybe a title to the next chapter. So I try to write one chapter of some book every morning, five days a week, except for vacation times during the year, because my goal is always to preserve Oklahoma history through mostly biographies. Three-fourths of my books are biographies. The others are institutional books like A History of the State Capitol, A History of the Governor's Mansion, uh, a book that I've just completed of the 75th anniversary of the Oklahoma Highway Patrol, or for example, the centennial of the journalism school at the University of Oklahoma. Sometimes I'll do institutional books like that, but in, if I can put out five or six a year, I've got to be very disciplined, and once the research is done in the afternoons or perhaps in the evening, I devote myself each morning to writing. No one's in my law office. Uh, my personnel have not shown up. No clients. If somebody knocks on the door, I ignore them <laughs> because that's my time when I sit with my research in front of my big screen on my computer and type away. I have my research in behind me here. Uh, there's, there are some shelves that of the current book I'm writing on, which is the Centennial History of the Journalism School, all the research is in folders by, by a decade. For example, I'm writing on the, uh, of the 1920s. Here's the folder of all my research on what happened at the Journalism School at the University of Oklahoma in the 1920s. When I complete that, it's a very orderly, in a very orderly fashion, I put that in that box on the floor because every, for every box there is in the office, that means there is a book project. So it's, it doesn't overwhelm you with a lot of information. If it's a person about someone's life, uh, I've often been asked, how would you put all the information about a former governor or United States senator's life? Doesn't that overwhelm you? It doesn't if you divide all of the research into decades of one's life. And then you just work on one folder at a time. So my desk is not very messy one folder at a time. When that folder is completed, goes into the box, I get the next folder and proceed with the story. Perhaps my most famous book nationally is Wiley Post. Uh, Wiley Post was a young man from southern Oklahoma who had a sixth grade education, lost his eye in an industrial accident, and still became the world's greatest pilot. Uh, in 1933, he was the first to solo around the world uh, in 1934, he discovered the jet stream over Bartlesville, Oklahoma, while attempting to fly to 50,000 feet for the first time. And to fly that high in an airplane uh, that uh, was not pressurized, he invented the pressurized flying suit. In this book, a former uh, Oklahoma astronaut, Tom Stafford, writes that um, uh, the same basic design that this self-educated sixth grade, grade dropout, Wiley Post, uh, used in developing the, uh, the suit, the space suit, in 1934 uh, is the forerunner of the modern space suit. Same design, basically the same premise that it works on. My only guiding force is that every five books I want to write about someone that no one's heard of. For example, uh, a few years back I decided that I wanted to write about a lady named Kate Bernard. Well, the only thing we have named for her in Oklahoma is a little halfway house. It turns out she was our first commissioner of charities and corrections. Not only that, a little five foot, 90 pound dynamo woman who was the only woman to speak to our constitutional convention and was the first woman elected to a statewide office in America. It's an incredible story. And, but nobody heard about her. In fact, she, she died, she never married and didn't have any children, of course. And, and, and uh, was unheard of and didn't have a tombstone for 50 years. So I wrote her biography, it kind of made her famous, and it e she even ended up with a wonderful uh, a bronze statue of her sitting on a bench now in our state capitol. So every fifth book, I'm gonna write about somebody that nobody's heard of, an Oklahoman 
who made some kind of contribution. How many books total have you written and on average how long does it take you to complete them? Well, 106 have been published. I have another eight coming out before the end of this year. Some have been written in past years and they're just simply in production. Uh, sometimes, uh, I, it took me as long as six months. The publisher of our newspaper uh, uh, one time, uh, 10, 15 years back, said, why don't you write a book about Oklahomans in baseball? Because we've had many, many major league stars. And I thought, oh, I'll bet there are 200 guys who've played major league baseball. I was way off. Turned out that one out of every 10 men who ever played major league baseball in America came through Oklahoma. Either born here, died here. We have long summers, so Mickey Mantle and and Johnny Bench all played uh, baseball in the summers. That that was so much research because I ended up at the Baseball Hall of Fame and other places to research. It took six months, but then I wrote a book that was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize: the biography of the great Ralph Ellison. Ralph Ellison was a young African American man who grew up here in Oklahoma City, very poor, lost his. Um, uh, father in an accident when he was three years old. Uh, a music teacher takes him under her wing and gets him a trumpet scholarship to Tuskegee. Then he goes off to New York and falls in with some writers and then of course writes Invisible Man, uh, perhaps uh, one of the great novels in, in Americana. Well, uh, I was asked to introduce him when we inducted him posthumously into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. So I thought I'll go to the library and I need to read a biography of Ralph Ellison. There was none. This is just 15 years ago. There had never been a biography, now I've been three or four since then, but there had never been a biography of perhaps one of our greatest American writers. So I teamed up with the lady who literally was the manager of the Ralph Ellison Library in the Oklahoma City system and had known Mr. Ellison. And so we, in about six weeks, uh, now there was nobody to interview, Mr. Ellison was gone, his wife, uh, had uh, dementia and really couldn't help us in New York. None of the people who he had gone to school with in Oklahoma City uh, were still alive. So I basically wrote his biography from his writings. He had written hundreds of short stories and magazine articles and, and, and a number of books that were, that were published after his death that, that simply told the story of him growing up in Oklahoma City, him going off to Tuskegee him wanting to be a trumpet player but ending up as one of the, uh, the world's greatest writers. So I guess it goes to six months. I've never taken more than six months. Another project is I was asked uh, by the FBI to write the story of the investigation of the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995 of the Murrah Building. Uh, I took that as a very solemn duty. I, my two co-authors were the two FBI agents who literally coordinated that investigation in Oklahoma and Kansas uh, within 30 minutes uh, of the crime. Uh, so they, they, they knew it all. The FBI provided me all 30,000 documents, copies of 30,000 documents of evidence that had been collected that had been used in the federal trial uh, that convicted and ultimately ended in the execution of Timothy McVeigh. And I, uh, with an open mind as a lawyer, I told them, look, if I conclude that it there's somebody else involved because there are books written about foreign involvement in somebody else, the Arab connection, whatever. Well, I concluded that it was only uh, McVeigh and Nichols. But that book perhaps took six months also. And that's all I did for six months. I didn't practice law some, law some weeks because that was a huge, huge amount of um, uh, interviewing people, uh, some of the victims, interviewing uh, the, the book is really not about the victims, but interviewing F other FBI agents who participated in the investigation, uh, even interviewing some of the lawyers who uh, represented some of the, the defendants. This is my basic, uh, what I call my uh, A-team library. If I'm writing a book in this room, there is hardly any Oklahoma history question that I can't find the answer to in here. For example, we had a very famous governor back in the 1930s named Alfalfa Bill Murray. He was quite a character. Well, Bill Murray wrote a four-volume set of Oklahoma history, or as he calls it, Memoirs of Governor Murray and the True History of Oklahoma. Well, if I'm writing, for example, last year I wrote a history of our Constitutional Convention called Miracle at Guthrie, of how in, in the territorial capital of Guthrie, 
uh, we had a constitutional convention. Bill Murray was the chairman of that constitutional convention. So often in writing that book, I would have to come to his history to see what his words were. But, there, but there's so many books just in this, probably 200 books that I refer to uh, several times per week. Now at my home, I have another perhaps 1,800 books uh, about Oklahoma or written by Oklahomans. Uh, for example, Tony Hillerman was in Oklahoma, or actually born at Sacred Heart, Oklahoma, wrote so many mysteries. Uh, I might have in my collection all of Tony Hillerman's books. But um, I, in writing, you can't have just original ideas. Harry Truman said, there is nothing new in the world except for history that you've not read. So uh, I would never pretend to know why that Alpha Alpha Bill Murray did something in the Constitution. Even if I'm reading the journal of what happened on a particular day in the Constitutional Convention, I can't really interpret that without looking to other sources. I'm going to look at his own book for him telling about that time of his life. Then I'm going to look at other books that other historians have written. Uh, Sixty years ago, a professor, Professor Lytton, wrote a wonderful two-volume uh, history of Oklahoma to that time. So I'm going to go back and see what Dr. Lytton said about that particular. I may draw my own conclusions, but I want to do so after I've read several secondary sources. Oklahoma's incredible story, I believe, is not about places and events but it's about our people. It's really not about the land runs, even though those are unique in world history. The way that Oklahoma was settled in land runs is really unique. But our story is really not about that event. It's about the people who, at the sound of a rifle or a cannon, strode off on a horse or on foot or bicycles or even jumping from slow-moving trains with a hammer and a stake in their hand and, and uh, uh, simply planted a stake in the ground and found for themselves a new home. The Trail of Tears is very unique in world history of how Oklahoma Indi Indian Territory, the eastern part of the state, uh, in the 1830s uh, when the, the, uh, the five civilized tribes were removed from the southeastern United States to Indian Territory. That is unique, but that st our story is not about that event. It's about those people some of whom were driven here like animals, who literally uh, hewed for themselves a new home out of the forests of Indian Territory. So, so there's always research going on. It's never a finished product until it's printed.